That'll keep you busy. Okay, so today we're going to start chapter two. Anybody know what this building is right here? What is it? Oops. The first and second Continental Congress. Today we call it Independence Hall. Have any of you guys been there? Did you get to go? Okay. It's not that big of a building. Okay. Uh, and originally it was called Carpenters Hall. And that's where they met for the first and second Continental Congress. And that's where they signed the Declaration of Independence. Okay. So they met, the founders met in this building for months and months. Okay. And then. When they went back to write the new constitution, 55 of them got together for the Constitutional Convention in Independence Hall. Okay, now to go there, guys, it's kind of interesting. I, I don't know if you guys know this, but in the 1770s, people were smaller than they are today. You ever been in like an elementary classroom with, with the small chairs and the low desks? They're kind of cute, you know? Um, now, they're not that small, but the desks and the chairs are all small, and they were like, they had to be like packed in there. Very uncomfortable, hot, no air conditioning. Okay, so um, it's, it's kind of interesting to go to Philadelphia and see some of this. You see the Liberty Bell, so forth. Now, just be careful. It's, a, it's not a very safe city these days. City of brotherly love is not. Okay. Um, any Rocky fans in here? Yeah. That's a good one. Uh, Marky Mark. Um, but the Rocky, you guys heard about uh, yeah, the black actor, Apollo Creed. He passed away this week. I did. Yeah. That was crazy. Yeah. Tony Keith died yeah, today. Yeah, Tony Keith. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a cancer, stomach cancer, is that? Yeah. Um, so, Weathers was this, this actor's name, uh, but Rocky, you know, that's Philly. That's, that's awesome stuff. Okay. All right. So, guys, today we're going to look at the roots of our democracy, where it comes from. Okay, so you guys know, do you know, the first permanent settlement in the New World by the British was called Jamestown, and what year was that? Sixteen oh seven. Then thirteen years later, in Massachusetts, is a place called what? Sixteen twenty. There's a rock there. Plymouth Rock. Okay. Any guys been there? Plymouth? Are you like the Griswolds? Your family travel and stuff like no. that? Uh, our kids did years ago. Oh, outstanding. What school? Yeah. What school was that? Say like the ladies. A couple of people from Sydney. Boston. <laughs> Lobster roll. I haven't had it, but I know. Boston's a great town, guys. Uh, talk a lot about. It. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the people that came to Jamestown, the people that came to Plymouth, the people that occupied the thirteen colonies were mostly from England. Okay. We, we start with the English, and then they transition to becoming the British, and they become Great Britain, and now they're the United Kingdom. Yes. Okay, so the English heritage or British ideals of limited government trace back to the 13th century with the signing of a document known as the Great Charter, or in Latin, the Magna Carta, okay? So prior to the Magna Carta, Kings could do whatever they wanted, 
to whoever they wanted, whenever they want. They could tax you as much as they wanted. They could take your property. They could put you in a dungeon. In 1215, the nobles, British nobles, forced King John to sign this document. Guys, there's a reason why we're talking about it 800 years later. Because this is a first. This is the first time they put limits on the king. This is the first time they made the king follow a rule of law that not only people had followed, nobility had followed, king had followed. So one of the basic principles that we get from the British is this principle of limited government. Okay? This is key. Now, in my honors class today, they actually had to read part of the Great Charter. And they had to hunt for certain rights that were given to the British people in the Great Charter. So they have a chart in their book, and they had to go through and find rights that were given to people through this constitution. So think of the Magna Carta as the English first constitution. We're going to talk about three of them today, Troy Law, three English constitutions. Walker, this is the first. Okay. What rights do we find in the Magna Carta? Well, let me tell you, have you ever heard of this, this no unreasonable search or seizure? That's in our Bill of Rights. That was given to the British people in 1215. No unreasonable search or seizure by the government. Now, in our Bill of Rights, what number of the 10 is that? One? Yeah, that's right. It's number four. Fourth Amendment, no unreasonable search and seizure. Another one we get is called due process from Magna Carta, okay, which is really described in our fifth, but also in some other amendments. Now, some of you guys are novices at this, so let me let me just kind of explain what this this term due process means. Any engagement that you have with a government official, and when you think an agent of the government. Could be a police officer, could be an FBI agent, okay, could be the D the DEA, hopefully not, the ATF, the IRS. Okay, you have an interaction with an agent of the government. There is a process as US citizens that we are due. So if you are taken downtown by a cop, that cop has to read you your what? Your Miranda rights. That comes from the Supreme Court case in 1961, Miranda versus Arizona. And here's why we have that right. Because you can't expect seniors in high school to sit in a government classroom and actually learn what their rights are. So we need to tell you what your rights are when we arrest you. Because that would be expecting too much of the citizens of this country to know their rights as Miranda did not know his. And he had the right to remain silent. He didn't know that. So he confessed. And his lawyers did a heck of a job. They said, listen, my guy didn't know. He was allowed to stay silent. This went all the way to the Supreme Court. Lo and behold, now we have Miranda rights. Okay? I don't think so. But guys, if they don't read you your rights, and they arrest you and take you downtown, well, you can get off for that. How long can they hold you without charging you? 72 hours. After 72 hours, guys, if they don't charge you, they got to kick you loose. Okay? You have to be arraigned. Now, the reason it's 72 hours is because of weekends. 
lot of times judges aren't working on the weekend. So you do not want to get arrested on a Friday night. Okay. Because the judge isn't going to be back till Monday. You're going to spend the weekend in the, in the lockup. Unless, of course, you're in New York City right now. Or if you're in San Francisco right now, they just book you, fingerprint you, and they kick you loose no bail. You guys hear about what happened in New York last week? Two, two NYPD police officers were brutally assaulted by seven migrants. They found them. They arrested them. They booked them, kicked them loose. And then they found out they were from Florida, in the country illegal. See, if you assault two cops in Florida, guess what's going to happen? You're going to jail. They know if they come to New York and do it, there's no bail. They just kick them loose. So these gangs, these thugs travel from other states to Cali- to New York and California, commit crimes, and go back. This is happening right now, as we speak, in our country. It's crazy. You hear about the, the, the guys that stole, like, Riding around on a moped, stole like 60 cell phones from like unsuspecting women in New York this week. This is like there's no rule of law. Okay, it's freaking crazy. Sorry, I'm getting off topic. Due process. Okay, you know what else you find in there? Is the right to a trial by jury in the Magna Carta. These rights date back. So listen. When 1607 and 1620, when these people came over from Britain, they brought these rights with them. They assumed, even though they were in a new world, they were still under the British rule, that they had these rights. Follow me. These rights are going to grow under two subsequent constitutions. Now, this is a journey that goes from 1215 to 1776. This is where we're going. We're going to go from absolute rule to rule by the people. Okay, it's a 500-year-plus journey. So that's what you should have named the chapter. A 500-year journey. Okay, from absolute rule to democratic rule. Okay, that's what we're doing. Okay, so the king has to follow the law. Okay. One of the things we got from the British also... So we got limited government, it's representative government. So this started small in Britain. It was mostly at the beginning. Council of nobles, religious leaders that advised the king. Okay, so that's kind of a council that would advise the king. Now, do these people, these nobles, have the best interest of the common man? No, they're worried about themselves. Now, in 1215, guys, what religion was England? What religion? Uh, yeah. Protestant Reformation is not until 1517. So it's Catholic. The Church of England, which is run by the king, is Catholic. Everybody with me? So, intertwined with the king, okay, with the state. The church and the state are connected. So eventually, guys, over time, this grew into a representative council. Again, not really looking out for the people so much. But over time, it developed this thing called the parliament. Okay. Now, in the beginning, this parliament, which was bicameral, you guys know what that means, two houses. You had the House of Lords and the House of Commons.
Now, when Parliament first began, which one of these had all the power? The Lords. Okay. Over that 500 year transition, that's going to flip. And the House of Commons today has all the power. The House of Lords is symbolic. Now, we have the Senate and the House, right? Right? How many members are there in the United States House of Representatives? Thank you. Let's try that again. How many members are there in the United States House of Representatives? One more time. How many members are there in the United States House of Representatives? Thank you. You're going to remember that. Yes? You already got it, Troy Lowe. Okay. So, the upper house, nobles, lesser, the lesser, the, the lessers, <laughs> the commoners, okay, the lower house. Yeah. They're going to try and limit the power of the monarchy. Okay, as time goes by. So about 400 years go by. Living under this first constitution called the Magna Carta. Now, this is a picture of the House of Commons today. So it's different than ours. Like in the House of Representatives and the Senate, the desks or chairs all face the front. In the House of Commons, you've got these two rows, okay? It's kind of interesting. This is a madhouse. It's crazy, okay? Ours is very subtle, quiet, respectable. Yeah, whatever. They think they're self-important, in my opinion. Now, This transition is going to start to switch from here to here. Power. Okay. When you're ready, I'm going to go to the next constitution called the Petition of Right. The English Petition of Right. R I G H T. Now, everybody knows these notes are available on Canvas, right? Okay. Now, 1628, Parliament has increased in power, and they're going to take more away from the king. Now, King Charles I, we're on number three right now, correct? And he's just been diagnosed with cancer. Did you hear? Okay. King Charles I is forced to sign this. What rights do we get out of this document? No false imprisonment. Okay, this kind of goes back to what's called habeas corpus. Okay, the government cannot hold you, imprison you, without charging you, giving you due process, a trial, a fair trial. Can't hold you. And there's two times in American history where presidents have suspended this. Once during the Civil War, Lincoln suspended habeas corpus, okay, and put people in prison without charging them with a crime. Now, there was a Civil War going on. So, guys, as we learned in history last year, when there's a crisis, governments will get more power, especially the executive. The second you might recall, it was during World War II, President Roosevelt rounded up Japanese Americans who had committed no crimes, were charged with no crimes, and were placed in internment camps in this country, suspending habeas corpus or false imprisonment. Now, this second one, no quartering of soldiers. You guys know what that means? cannot force the army to house soldiers in your house. They cannot force you to take people into your home. 
soldiers. Okay. Now, Major brought this up in his long answer question. Guys, as the colonies began to rebel in the 1770s, Boston was at the forefront. The British sent 20,000 troops into Boston, and much of the Royal Navy was docked in Boston Harbor. They didn't have a place to house all those soldiers. So they quartered them in people's homes. Now, if you lived in Boston in 1774, and the British started doing this, you damn well knew that you had the right not to have soldiers quartered in your home. And you knew that British were violating your constitutional rights. You follow me? This is going to give them ammunition to rebel. Okay? And it goes back to John Locke, that a government does not secure these rights should be abolished or overthrown. It all feeds together here, okay? No military rule during peacetime. This is, this is martial law, okay? Now, if you're a conspiracy theorist right now, which I like to be from time to time. Here's an idea. You could let millions of people into the country, many of which come from countries that are enemies of your country, and unleash them into your country and see what happens. And when chaos ensues, maybe we need to call up the army. Marsh, buying any of this? You worried? You're not worried. <clears throat> you can stay in your bubble as long as you want, as long as you can, until your bubble bursts. Walls come crashing down. Sorry. All right. No taxation without Parliament's approval. We know about this one, right? So no longer can the king just tax whoever he wants, whenever he wants. Parliament has to approve that. If there's going to be a tax, this would be taxation done through representation. Through Parliament. Representative government, they provide for the taxes. They're the ones that allow for taxes, not the king. We're going to use this one, too. Yes? So... Other things we get from this, trial by jury, is found in this document as well, okay? And no soldiers in your house, okay? Now, what happens next, after King Charles signs this, he starts to violate it. The parliament's going to get mad. What are they going to do to King Charles the First? They're going to cut off his head. Literally. Now, by 1628, guys, England is, Britain now, is no longer Catholic. Protestant Reformation took place, Martin Luther, 99 theses on the, on the door, right? 1570, okay, almost about 500 years ago, 507 years ago, okay, might have been 19, I think it's 1570, okay, now, so, do Catholics have freedom of religion in Britain? No, Catholics are persecuted in Britain. Do Protestants have freedom of religion in France? No, okay. But the church is still tied to the government, the Anglican Church or the Church of England. Okay? No separation there. Okay? We're going to learn some things about their system that we're going to reject later on. Yes? We're going to have some of our own rights that we come up with. So, they kill King Charles for 11 years. 
There's no king. They call this the long parliament. And there's this one dude that kind of took over and it was horrible during this long parliament. What's that guy's name? He's not a king. His name was Oliver. Oliver? C. Cromwell. Did you learn this in the English, British, English history? Yeah, I can't remember this one. English literature, I should say. Did you learn it in English this year? No. Okay, because Mr. Barber used to teach English to seniors. We would be talking about this. No, we, 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 we don't even get taught English. English. We just get assigned. We get assigned a lot of stuff. I'm hearing there's some issues. Yeah, there, there's both, a lot of, lot both of teachers. Are back. So, after 11 years of Oliver Cromwell, they're like, uh, we need to get a king back in here. So, this is called Restoration of the Crown in 1660. Okay. Who do they bring in? King Charles II. Now, Charles, he's all right. Okay. He's abiding by a lot of this stuff. He's doing a pretty good job. But there's a problem. This, now, guys, this is like a soap opera. Okay. A family soap opera. King Charles doesn't have a son. He doesn't have an heir to the throne. And if you don't have a son, the heir would be your brother, if you have a brother. And Charles II has a brother. His name's James II. But what's wrong with James? He's Catholic. Can you imagine a Catholic king presiding over a Protestant nation in the Anglican Church? Well... They don't really have a choice when Charles II dies of natural causes. James comes in and they say, listen, James, to Parliament. James, Walker, I think that was his middle name. So I'm just saying that to wake you up. Walker, James, I mean, King James, you cannot appoint any Catholics in your cabinet. And James, you have a son. You will have that son baptized in a, press, in a Protestant ceremony, not a Catholic. So James becomes king. And then James' second wife has a child. And it's a boy. That's what he does, as any good Catholic would do, as baptized by a Catholic priest. And Parliament wants his head. So he's on the run. Okay, with his little boy. Where does he flee? Now, across the channel. Goes to France. Mr. Ebright, I was going to say France. Okay. Inside joke. Okay. Um, Louis the 14th. Okay. Now, um, Britain's without a king again. So they got to go find a king, but it's hard to keep the bloodline flowing here. They found a guy. His name's William of Orange. Where is Orange? Not Scotland. Not Ireland. Not Norway. Okay, stop. During the Olympics, you got any soccer fans in here? Yeah. Olympics and the World Cup. This team always wears orange. The Netherlands. William of Orange of the Netherlands. And he's a Protestant. And he hates the French, which is great. Because the British hate the French. They're going to have four wars against them. Okay? And get this. William, who's got a strong army, hates the French, is married to Mary of Braganza. And who is Mary of Braganza? James's daughter. 
James' second's daughter, let me get James up here, from his first marriage. That was a noble. So the bloodline continues. William and Mary will accept the throne under these conditions. The English Bill of Rights. In 1788. Okay. So he dies in 16, uh, 1688. Okay. The Glorious Revolution. They call this. In England. Okay. They got rid of their Catholic king. Got William and Mary. It's not so glorious for Catholics in England. Okay, so William and Mary. Now, if you look at the notes, like if you pulled up the notes on your computer, and you look at this painting of Mary of Braganza and James II, you'll see striking similarities. And that's the Glorious Revolution, okay? Now, the English Bill of Rights is going to add some new rights that the first two didn't have, including no excessive fines or bail and no cruel and unusual punishment, which we can find in our Eighth Amendment, okay, in the Bill of Rights. It's kind of an interesting story, okay? When I, you kind of feel like you're in world history again for a few minutes. Yes? No? Yeah, yeah but I hate that. You hated that? Yeah. So when I was in college, one of the times I was in college, I've been in college so many dang times, okay? This was the second time I was in college. I was uh, getting my teaching degree. And I want to teach history, so I'd take a bunch of history classes, too. I was taking a class called Western Civilization at Newman University with a professor named Dr. Solentrop. You guys know any Solentrops? I think her name was Jean. And she was cruel. No, that's not the one. I'll show you some of the work I did in this class. This ancient work. It's ancient. Yeah, this is the one. Yeah, this is the first one. Okay. Yeah. Now, guys, this is this is uh shoot. This is the mid '90s, so computers. You know, I had a graphic arts background prior to going back to teach, so I did this, and she was blown away. I got a 97. That's how blown away she was. Okay. This is about absolute monarchs over here. Come into the uh, weakening of that kind of stuff we're talking about here. And then the Enlightenment, which is like John Locke and stuff. And then uh, the French Revolution. Okay. So she asked me to make copies of this book. I'm like, I'm going to get an A in this one. Okay. Right. Yeah. Next one. I mean, that was a lot of work. You know what I mean? Like, drawing all those boxes on a computer, this is back. I'm using a program called PageMate. Okay? I don't even know if Word's been invented yet. They're still, they still got, like, yeah, Word, we, we used a different kind of word process. So this one, which is causes World War One. Okay, guys, this class that you're taking right now is not that hard. This was freaking hard, okay? I got a freaking B on this. Yeah. Industrial Revolution. It's a B. Ouch. And Al, this is a freaking undergraduate class. What did she, did she tell you why it wasn't an A? 
I just don't think she liked giving eggs. It sounds like it, because that was perfect. I got a freaking B in that class. I worked my tail off. Okay, enough about me. All right. William and Mary. That's how far I got in the other class. Okay, so listen. Um, guys, what we're doing, we're on this journey. Okay? This journey. So what happens is the colonists come over here. And because, how long does it take for a message in, say, 1650 to get from New York to London and back? Five, months, five no, six months to there and back. <laughs> this is my ship to the king, like getting a message to the king or the parliament. It took months. So, guys, when the colonists came over here, they were allowed to establish their own governments to some extent. And some of these colonists, and listen, every new person born here in the new world. Is an American. George Washington was born here in America. Thomas Jefferson was born in America. John Adams was born in America. Okay, these guys were Americans, and they grew up under colonial governments that generally allowed a lot of self-rule, where the king didn't bother them, the parliament didn't bother them. Then they did. And so we're going to learn about these colonial governments, guys, and then what went wrong, okay? And that we'll pick up with again tomorrow. Good? Okay. I tried my hardest.